pleasure and it's a, it's a great honor to have here today Giacomo Rizzolatti. So, Professor Rizzolatti, I didn't know if he was born in Kiev, in the format, former Soviet Union. So, he did his university studies in Padua, where he graduated uh, in medicine and obtained a specialization in neurology. Then he spent the first three years of research at the University of Pisa, at the Institute of Physiology, directed at that time by Professor uh, Giuseppe Moruzzi. His subsequent academic career took place mostly at the University of Parma, where he started as an assistant professor in the human physiology, and then he became professor of human physiology. He worked in the department of psychology of the McMaster University, Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and later on at the Department of Anatomy at the University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. He has a close collaboration with the Department of Computer Science and Neuroscience of the University of Southern California, Los Angeles, and with the Amazon Lovelace Brain Mapping Center at UCLA in Los Angeles. He has been president of the European Brain Behavior Society in the Italian Society for Neuroscience, and for several years he has directed the European Training Program in Brain and Behavior Research, sponsored by the European Science Foundation, and he has been a member of the European Medical Research Council. Currently, he is a member of the Scientific Committee of Foundation Thyssen, and associate member of the Neuroscience Program directed by Gerald Edelman in San Diego. Also, he is a member of the Academia Europea, and of Academy of Vinci, an honorary foreign member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has been recently elected member associate étranger of the Academy des Sciences de France, and he has got several prizes as Golgi Prize for Physiology, George Miller Award of the Cognitive Neuroscience Society, and Petronelli Prize for Medicine of Academia de Vinci, and the Arkitska Prize for Physiology, Academia de Scienze Corina. Now, his main scientific interest is neuroscience, concerned the study of the motor system and its role in cognitive function. Last but not least, he discovered the mirror neural system, and in the last years, he devoted his research to study such a system. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, and uh, please. Visual area, motor area, and so on. 
also Sumer and more Michigan Musical Group Association habits. Well, that is very nice. It was very important, especially for a neurologist. But if you are a modernist, it's really so important to know that visual area is area 17 and the motor cortex is in area 4. Can you model? Can you do something with that? The answer will be no. So, although it was very useful, the work which has been done for practical reasons, I think in terms of knowledge, it was very little. We knew that there are localization of functions, that's for sure, it was well demonstrated. But how these functions are organized? The classical example is visual area. Everybody knew from the beginning of the century, from the war essentially, that is the occipital lobe and also the complex uh, optic track system with uh, chiasm and so on it was well described. Well, the people started to record the single neuron from this area. That was a big advance of the second part of the century because of better anesthesia, because of uh, antibiotics. You can record at least in animal chronically for a long period and so on. So the people start to record even with single neurons from different parts of the brain. And one center in Germany, in Freiburg, was very interested in describing the property of visual area. So they started to record from the area, surprise, the visual area does not respond to visual stimuli. So they use a different type of flesh, color, and so on, no responses. Why? That was the big discovery of human and visual. They showed that while the retina it's made of like photocell. If you go up in the organization of the visual system, you arrive to area 17 and you need to present restricted stimuli because each neuron has a receptive field with inhibitory flank. So if you present a flash of light, the inhibitory flank stops you, so you must have stimuli which are restricted in space and the most interesting stuff was they must have a specific orientation. What you see here on the, in this slide it's uh, their experiment in which is summarized that there is Start to learn something about how the, 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 
the nervous system was not only where are the functions localized. Here is a, a subsequent uh, stuff, these blobs that you see here, they are uh, blobs where color is a code. It was a very surprising finding that color and uh, orientation were not coded by the same neurons. But that doesn't matter. Well, the visual system became the king of the neurophysiology, and then in a few years, people found that there are many visual areas, as you can see here, many, many of them, and in order to summarize, the people say they are too stream, a ventral stream which goes towards the temporal lobe, and the dorsal stream which goes towards the parietal lobe. And also it was discovered to what is doing the temporal lobe. Although this study at the beginning were criticized, and even the people made a joke of them, actually they are absolutely true, and now we know that the work of Charlie Ross and his co-worker is completely correct, it's fully correct. So what they discovered? They discovered that this analysis that we found in the visual cortex is somehow completed in the infrared in in temporal lobe because you synthesize and you have even neurons which respond to a face. That was the, the people was laughing, saying, oh, you have a mother cell in this. Now we know this. True, it has been repeated in human recordings, even human for the fMRI. So we know that ventral stream finally arrived to this conclusion that the kind of, uh, I could say vocabulary, but anyway, it's a museum of uh, paintings. Parietal lobe was discovered later also because it was very difficult to record from the parietal lobe in anesthetized animals. That's an important point. Why in the temporal lobe? Most of the experiments have been done in, uh, with light anesthesia, but I don't know, it was impossible to do it. So it was the merit of Moncastle who first described the property of the parietal lobe. Parietal lobe for all neurologists was called an association area. And the general idea was the following the parietal lobe arrived at uh, different types of sensory modalities. They are put together and we have the person. Big mysterious thing, but anyway, that was the idea. Still, many neurologists think that. Well, the world has been discovered by Moncastle and maybe even deeper by Iverinen that parietal lobe is plenty of motor neurons. So he exaggerated, he said that it's command neurons, that's what the term used by Moncastle. But anyway, it's absolutely true, and here is something which has been done in my lab. Uh, Rose and for us to collaborate in this uh, study. What you see here, it's a careful study done. Now it's easy to put many electrodes so we can do really a very careful exploration, not one electrode at a time that was done in the past. So you see that there is a series of green dots. Well, the green dots indicate that in good penetration you have motor activity, except in the most posterior part here where you have this yellow, so eyes. What is most interesting is this stuff, it's organized in a somatotopic way. So you have at the beginning hand, then mouth, I'm sorry, then mouth, then you have hand, then you have arm reaching movement, and then eye. So you have a skeleton made somatotopically organized. It is not just uh, some uh, neurons there or there, but it's really a somatotopic organization which represents the skeleton of the inferior parietal lobe. Of course, it was true that it's an association area because on this motor, the top of this motor activity, there are visual, uh, somatosensory, and so on. But the basis is that the other finding that I already described it first, but we studied it maybe better. We found that many of these neurons encode the goal of an action. Here you see, for example, that if a rich neuron, so if the monkey, that's the meaning of the monkey, the monkey extends the arm, the rich object, there is a discharge. If it takes food, there is a discharge, different movement, but if it just pushes, it's again extension. There is no discharge, it should be a goal. 
And here it's another neuron steal from parietal lobe, which describes the activity of grasping again, depending on time to grasping. The same stuff has been found also in the premotor cortex. So most of you in the premotor areas, including some even the primary, does not encode simply the acceleration or the velocity of some dynamic properties, but encode the color motor action. I think that was, I think, our greatest contribution of Barber in the 1890s was that we studied the motor and the parietal lobe using a methodological approach. Instead of putting a monkey in a seat and just looking at how it's doing, how it's performing, if it's moving to the right, to the left, we played with the monkey. And we found that there are many interesting properties. For example, one is that it's a golden the motor right. So the goal. It doesn't matter if I grasp with the right hand with the left hand with the mouth. What is important is the motor right. The second is the richness of visual responses. So the skeleton is motor, but there are plenty of visual responses. And the most interesting are those colored mirror neurons. So here is an example. So why they are so curious and interesting. Because you have the motor activity, but the visual activity is effective if it corresponds, it's congruent with the motor run. So if I am grasping, the good response would be if he's grasping. If I am breaking, the good response would be breaking. Before showing you a film, which explains maybe better what I'm saying, there is one concept which is very difficult also for neurologists. If a neuron responds both to visual and to motor activity, it's stupid to say that this visual motor, this neuron, depends on the output. If we are in the motor cortex, the output is motor, you know, because if I stimulate this area, I have movement. So why do we say that an eye, that a neuron responds to a visual stimulus? Actually, there is a motor neuron which is triggered by visual stimulus, but not the visual stimulus. Then it's cannot change the synaptic connection. So if I have a neuron which is have synaptic connection with motor cortex, with parameter tract and so on, that should remain, even if I want to do the movement of if it's stimulated because I observe another person. Now I will show you a motor a mirror neuron and you will see clearly what I mean. With the action potential. This bam, 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 that you will hear are the firing of neurons. So, neuron fire and the language of neuron, of course, are action potential. If they are more tap, 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 it means that the action is it's good, it's effective. Neurons, <laughs> so the goal is 
there, because we were also running close to the mouth, it's okay. And they say, I tell it doesn't matter who is doing the action, the monkey or the person. So, so here there is one interesting thing. So we have a transformation of sensory representation of an action in a motor representation of the same action. So the neuron fire, because the sensory representation triggered the motor representation. But now you see there is a, a very important paradigmatic shift. One, the people who are interested in the visual system and arrive at also the conclusion that in the infrotemporal world we recognize uh, faces because there are specific neurons for that. Still, the idea was somehow related to, let's say, to Hugh Locke and the empiricism idea. So there is association, there is one thing, it's associated to the other that we arrive. Here, we change completely logic. What is fundamental is the motor activity. So there is motor activity, and I recognize the action because what you do, it's encoded inside my activity. So the motor system is inside myself, and when you do something, it goes to. I will show you another example. So that was my thing. Of course, we did experiment in humans, and uh, and here I have to say something very good, and then we say something very bad. The very good was that when the brain image appeared, we all were extremely excited. It was the first time that one can see what happens in the brain, even if you don't do anything. I remember a paper by Roland, a group of Danish people, in which they asked the subject just to think a moment, and there was an activity motor cortex in the motor having a and so on. So you imagine something marvelous you can see. But if you think that I will come back to this point, in a sense we are back to the idea or to the experiment of the meaning of the century. Because if I know that I do an action, I have an activation there, I don't know anything about the mechanism. And sometimes you can have a very crazy this has been published in Neuron, a paper which I think was terrible, which was the result of a comment of another big study in America in which they claim that there is an area for gambling. And the area for gambling is located inside the motor cortex. I, I can swear that I don't believe that it's possible. This has been published with excellent people in nature. But why? Because if you do uh, fMRI, if you have the neurophysiological basis, what you see is correct. If you use only fMRI, you can do have terrible mistakes because you see what happens in the brain, a very complex task. And uh, I'm sure that gambling and not something that you, you think a movement. If it's a poker, you think that you are doing that. If another type of gambling, I don't know, you think to. I don't know what you do, I am not the gambler, but if somebody is gambler probably can suggest me other hypotheses. Anyway, fMRI, when it has been discovered and when it has been used properly on the basis of neurophysiological evidence was extremely important uh, method. We used it and we found that was a fact experiment done in Iran many years ago that also in humans, if you if the subject line in the scanner observe an action, this action activates the motor cortex. Exactly as in the monkey and practically the circuit is the same. We did in the pet, but subsequently I did in, in Los Angeles fMRI, but I will show a beautiful picture which is the result of the experiment done in uh, it's a, it's a meta-analysis made by Carl Zies, Kasper, Carl Zies, Kasper, and others. So it's a unique group. It's 90 uh, experiments on observation, and if you see, it's very clear that this observation uh, determined an activity in the posterior part of the brain, occipital lobe, and in part of the temporal lobe. Then parietal is very important, the same parietal I mentioned before, and then the premotor cortex. Now, I told you that according to our view, crucial is the motor representation. So if you ask the neurologist what is represented 
in the rostral part of inferior parietal lobe. He will tell you the deletion of this area will produce what is called apraxia, idiomotor apraxia. So the person will have problem in using tools without paresis and without arthesis. It's really, if you have seen one of these patients, it's unbelievable because if you ask him how you use a tool, he doesn't know how to do. But if he has a tool there, he grasps it because it's a tool, but he cannot represent how to use the tool. Well, with Giovanni and others, we try to see what happens if you present tool action to a person. And here you see an example. If you present an action made by the hand in A, you have an activation of visual area of parietal cortex and premotor area, as I told you. Now, that's a robot arm, which has been recognized by Paolo Dario. And you see when the robot is grasping, it's very similar. So grasping is understood, and all subjects understood the person who's grasping. However, if you do a subtraction, you see that there is a part of the brain which is not related, in the, uh, is not activated when you grasp with your hand, but it's present when you uh, use the tool. At this point, we take other experiments and use a different tool, and you see always on the left side of the brain there is activation. So the part of the brain which is used to grasp an object, the tool we use a tool, is activated when you observe the tool. So that's exactly prove you what I said before. If you have a um, motor ability, you understand action of the other because you map it on the motor ability. That's what happened here. Well, now I move on something which I think is extremely interesting. And in terms of evolution, probably precede what they said, because we started, because I was interested in this area, by motor cortex, by something which is already in psychology called experiment, called action. But we have a lot of other things which are much more ancient, like emotion. Now, I will show you some experiment on the insula. The insula is here, it's part of the structure of the brain which is hidden inside the, the temporal parietal lobe. With uh, Fausto Caruana and Amel Gensini, we made an exploration of this area, and we found this very heterogeneous. By the way, there are, I mentioned before RF gambling, but if you read the literature of of insula, you can find something even more crazy, like the area of, of the ego, of the self inside the crazy. But if you do appropriate experiment, you see that insula is made by different parts and different properties. Now I will show you what happens when you stimulate, electrically stimulate, it's not recording, it's stimulation, the rostral part of the insula in the monkey. Now what you have to do now is not, there will be no spikes, but you have to observe the behavior of the monkey and a red light which will appear. Red light means stimulation. Something wrong with this food. 
that's very precious to them. No. She looks at it and says, well, it's good, but on the other hand, no, there's something wrong. Stimulate the 
legislation indicate that it's based on visual motor activity. I know what means this gas because when I stimulate desire, I, I vomit, I have this. In human it's the same, by the way. I show it our experiment in the monkey, but there is data obtained in young in which they stimulate insulin in patients with epilepsy, and they have the same thing. Uh, if there is time, then we can discuss, because I think this mechanism is fundamental. Because if this mechanism is destroyed, and we can understand the other people only in cognitive way, it's completely different. If it's cognition, it's like we understand physical properties. So it's not a human being. If we can understand phenomenology, it became human being. So what about the future? I already told you my criticism about the fMRI, and I think many people are now convinced that the fMRI is great if it's used in a certain way, but has certain limitations, one interpretation. But then there is something else which I have not mentioned, but it's even more dramatically wrong with the fMRI time. fMRI provides you a, something which is in space, but not in time. So, a series of areas are activated, but you know which is first, which is second, which is the order. Again, for a modernist, I don't think you can model anything if you say just simply that when you do an action, you have four areas. So, we are back to the beginning of last century when neurologists demonstrated what is the area for vision, what is the area for audition, what is the area for motor. Now, what we can do to go beyond that. I think there is one technique which is very difficult to do it, is the stereo EG. So recording from the brain of human beings, uh, putting the electrodes inside the brain. So and now the technique allows it. I will show you first something. That's what happens if you stimulate the median nerve. That's something which in uh, neurosurgery they do routinely. So you see uh, nice activation. Now I will show you in time. In time is completely different. Because in the beginning you have a big block in corresponding sort of sensory context. Then it moves rostrally, the yellow stuff is going more rostrally towards the motor cortex. But look what will happen 20 milliseconds later. There is still a, an activation, a tonic activation of the posterior part of the insula. And again, if you look at the neurological data, the probably awareness of our body is related. No, 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 no. Now, I will show you some experiment that we did uh, in uh, Milano. In the Guarda, there is a center for surgery of people who have drug-resistant epilepsy. Drug-resistant epilepsy is about 20% of people with epilepsy. And if you can localize the focus and ablate it, you are cured. The results are very good. It's 90, 95% of people are completely uh, have no epilepsy anymore. So the people which I mentioned here is in red. It's Russo who is the head neurosurgeon. Ivana Sartori is the neurologist we work with most. And then the other people are physiologists. And Pietro Vanzini was the guy who made most of software which rendered possible the study. Because it's very difficult not to record for one patient to record from many patients to put the data together and to make all this analysis. It's not easy at all. Well, here, just to show you complexity, what they do, they first made uh, an uh, MRI just to see how is the brain. Then uh, the red spots are where the electrode has been implanted. And that's interesting because they implant about 10, 16 electrodes. If you pick, stick with people which hate animal experience, say, oh, poor monkey, he has an, an electrode in the brain. This patient has 16 electrodes, and they stay very well, because we have no receptors inside our brain, so you can put many electrodes. Anyway, that's okay. So they put the electrode. Of course, they put the electrode not for us, but for the patient. So in this case, it was explored essentially the temporal node, but then in another patient, they explored the parietal. So if you have patience <laughs> and you have time and do the 
capacity to map it is you have excellent results. On the other side, you see a geography, because they must be very careful not to put their electrodes inside the, the vessel, the artery. And they use an electrode, which also we are using now for monkey, which is an electrode which you record not only from the tip, but also from the shaft. So, imagine now, 16 electrodes, each of them with 10 points of recording, you have 160 points from one patient. And we are so fortunate that in Milano, they operate practically every week. So on Monday, they implant this electrode, they operate on Friday. We have four days in which they record stereo AG and video of this patient. And we, to the patient degree, but all patient degree, can make tests of every type, psychological, test, neurological, that's what we want. I must say that the collaboration is very good because they are bored. They can wait there until the neurosurgeon knows where is the, the fox, the elective fox. So they are very collaborative. So going here is just something which I like because it's beautiful graphically. That's where are the electrode and where are the vessel. So the reconstruction of vessel to show that there is no nature So that's I will show you. We have several experiments, some published, some unfortunately not yet because we elaborate them. But this is something which come back to my idea to work the motor port and so on. So this is an experiment done in this patient. And look at the lower row. You present the stimulus once. Then the patient use the tool and try to I mean the patient look at the tool which is grasping the object and finally there is a contact. It's very simple. So it's observation. Now what happens in the brain? Now, you can see here that that's hand action, as a matter of fact. I will show you in a moment too large, so that's hand action. So the black dots are what happens when the EEG desynchronize and the observation of the object. So not the capital, it's just the object. And you see it's essentially different. This way to present seems to be crazy, but it's the best way because you can see the gray matter, and most of our brain is gray matter, and in the human, is inside the source. So you have to open it, that's fun as indeed, it's not our invention. But anyway, it's a flat map, and here is the occipital lobe, the frontal lobe is there. That's the intraparietal sorbus, that's the central sorbus. So if you see at the beginning, when you did this, these black dots, then, when you start the action, you have an activation which goes in front to the parietal lobe and reach the premotor cortex. So, exactly what we demonstrated with uh, other methods. Here, the surprise was these blue dots. The blue dots are contact, are uh, leads which can be synchronized when the action is finished, when you reach the goal. And if you look, this area here, it's somatosensory cortex, in area S2. So in a sense, in our brain, when I see an action, it's repetition of the other guy is doing, including the end of action and the somatosensory. In a sense, you feel in your hand that this guy has grasped it. This was as little their hand action, but we have also two action, and the point of interest is here. You see this cluster of red dots, a lot of red dots here. Here is the head, very few of them. That's exactly this area in the uh, left inferior parietal lobe, which we demonstrated with your one. It's active in fMRI. The number of activation here is much stronger. Okay, now that was only the beginning, because we say, it started, it reached the goal, and so on. But we can have real time. And here is something which we are very started to do. It's very recent experiment, not yet elaborated completely. That's in general what happens when you have this action. But now look in terms of time. In terms of time, first there is here, 
then it's these white dots. And the time is very short from here to here, so you understand the action because the mirror system is active. And at the end, you have, that's much later. So what it means that when I see somebody grasping with an object first, I understand he's grasping, and only later I understand he grasped with a tool. So it's, you can separate in time what you understand progressively during this action. That's something that now Pietro Ranzini is analyzing, it's not yet finished, but anyway, a basic data we are sure are correct. Now I will finish with something else, which again, remember my concept that traditionally the physiologist was very much related to empiricism. So it started from the visual areas or from sensory sensory go on. The other point of view is that the basic is what is the model system. The action is first, like in data. The action is first, then the other. So, so now you see, you will see what happens in the sequence. There's an experiment which we did again in Milano and uh, Ivana Sartori and Fausto Tarwani. We stimulated the sequence many points. Some of them are gray. If you stimulate the gray stimulus, especially here, the patients say, I have an urge to move, I want to move, I want to go away. But there is nothing so obvious. But here, in the region which is rostral to generous of the corpus callosum, there is this colored yellow and red things. What happens when you stimulate here? He starts laughing. There's a center for laughing. And in some cases, there is really, he said, I don't know why. In the other, he tried to rationalize, say, well, it's come back to my mind, a funny episode. So, but they said, they don't know why they are laughing. They are laughing because they are compelled to laugh because there is set for that. At this point, we did a classical mirror experiment. So we showed it to them. Now, first I will show you, maybe you can see, where well, sometimes it doesn't work. So, that's a patient which will be operated in a few days. So, certainly it's not a happy patient. It's lying here, and about 20 meters is swollen. It's swollen. Just for a second. So the, the surgeon asked the girl, which is here, to read this word, some word, and to see if she's able to do it. <laughs> so I think it's clear. So she can, she is doing completely another task. She has to read the data if she's able to read it or not, maybe with this blocket of their uh, talking capacity because we stimulated that. And then she starts laughing. And then, to conclude, that has been our uh, mirror experiment. So we presented to the same girl and we recorded from the same point which produced the activity you just saw. And there were three video clips. Uh, the boy which was rather laughing or crying or neutral. The red line here, here, is the desynchronization when you see somebody laughing. So the center of laughing became immediately active when you see somebody laughing. And of course she understands it. So in a sense, again, it comes back to my idea that action first you know what is laughing because you read, and when the laughing center is activated, you understand the other people's laughing. I don't know the validity of this, uh, how broad it. I think it's certainly true for fear, certainly true, true for anger, it's true for that. For pain, it's much more complicated because the results we have, uh, there are some results of pain which is in this direction. For example, this is your surgeon, Hutchinson which show it that when he push an, a, a, a needle inside the, the, the skin of the patient, the patient say, I have pain. Then he the same, took a, a needle and pushed in his own skin. And the patient say, 
I feel better, I don't understand pain. But actually, it's, if we stimulate, there is no pain. So maybe it's not real pain, but the danger, which is completely different. Pain is a very complicated issue. But let's forget about that. Um, the message is that the mirror system is the basic system for understanding action of others. And it's based not on association between them, but the fact that we know how to do an action. When you learn an action, or because in evolution you already know how to do it, laughing, crying, and so on, you understand the other. So um, the message, I've been asked to give a kind of more general talk, the message is that it's a lot of things that we understand not because it's coming from outside, but it starts from inside. We know how to do it, and then we we'll understand. Thank you. Do. 
though I don't know for sure the arts will end up as death, but I have and not following the teachers with no practice with us. So you expect that maybe the violence increase or decrease and so on and so on, everything that happens. No, it's not my feel like right, actually. No, no, no. So thank you. Are there pathologies so which uh, you can attribute to the story about the uh, or the nerve views? Uh, you mean pathology of the mirror neurons with the absence of mirror neurons? You know, mirror neurons are motor neurons. So I think that the development of the motor system can, if it's pathological, can cause some disease. And uh, working with here is somebody with whom we did the experiment on autism. So in autism, for example, there are many motor deficits and they have been neglected for years. So those have been described by Cameron, but the first description was already clear that they have deficits. They have not included in uh, clinical uh, neurology, pathology. But most of them, but now think, if the motor system does not develop well, and you have difficulty in having a good motor system, you don't understand the action of others. But you don't understand the action of others, then it became a vicious circle. You don't respond in an appropriate way, and so on. So I am not the idea, as Ramachandra uh, wrote, that mirror neurons, uh, broken mirror neurons means autism. Autism is a very complicated disease which has so many different faces. But I think at the core, it's a poor development of the motor system. And to try to develop more playing with this kid and so on, it's very important. That's as far as uh, children. Uh, uh, well, a vision of the motor system or the mirror system is very hard to think because if you have a vision of a part of it, you have a deficit of some time, but you, you cannot destroy the whole mechanism of us. I wonder uh, whether uh, there is a, correspond a correspondence of one by one between neurons and actions. For example, the first video you showed us, you put the electrode and then you heard the action potentials of one neuron that was a grasping neuron. I wonder how many different stimuli did you try before uh, grasping and if this neuron does not respond to any other stimuli. Well, to achieve grasping, it's not a matter of one or ten neurons, but it's a population of neurons. And as a matter of fact, that's the point that we studied with with uh, Michael Arby many years ago. So his idea, he's correct, he's a computer scientist, that in order to reach grasp, you have to take in consideration the beginning of action, then the head shaping, then the movement, then the time, and then what we call the final grasp, when you touch the object and then hold it. So actually, I simplify a lot when I say this neural code grasping, this neural code, one aspect of a long sequence which will lead to grasping. So from this point of view, from point of view of vision, it's really, uh, it depends, because we have a very selective neurons which fire only if you have a specific grasping like that, and then a lot of neurons which fire grasping, even done with an instrument. So again, it's, uh, unfortunately, in the talk, one uh, simplify a lot, but you are completely right. It should be extended, what I said, uh, otherwise that makes sense. For the wonderful talk. Uh, I was wondering, you know, mice are a very nice model to manipulate. Mice are a very nice model to manipulate the activity and to uh, reach like center resolution uh, details. So, what is known about uh, mice and mirror neurons? Do they have such a system? Well, that's a, a question which, if one can solve, will be really a breakthrough in science. 
Because you know, with monkey you can do very little. You cannot uh, examine which are the mediator, what is the genetic properties of these neurons which are you neural. Know. If we have a, a model, a, a rodent model, it can really open a lot of fields. It could be used, like you, you study here, many studies like Paris and so on. But it's very difficult. We try it uh, with rats. But you know, our capacity to communicate with rodents is minimal. So if rodents is there, I have grasped it. <laughs> it's a monkey there. Monkey is very just what I am doing. The rodents, though. And so we tried to have two rodents, one looking at the other. And again, it was very difficult. But I must say, maybe our lab is not very good in this field. It should be somebody who is saying, one possibility which has been suggested to me, maybe instead of using the vision to use the sound, uh, and take the matter called the puppies in a certain way, so maybe to see if communication, uh, vocal communication, would be better. Would be better. But I confess we have no empathy with that. <laughs> Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering, you uh, cited um, twice the paradigm shift from a uh, um, sensation-centered approach to a, a motor-centered approach, and that's very interesting in my opinion. But I was wondering, in what extent the complex uh, patterns of movement you show that are uh, innate, and to what extent they are instead learned? Because uh, I quite easily understand that someone has a, maybe have a laughing center, a lotus center. But grasping is something different. The, the monkey needs to, uh, when, when the monkey sees someone grasping, uh, she, she must have grasped something to have learned this sensation. So I was wondering what is innate and what is learned. Can we learn empathy in this, in this uh, framework, or is it something that we have already decided? And what you ask it, it's a kind of very debated question. And for many years, the people will say, well, maybe mirror neurons is just an association stuff. Even the mother or the paper in, neuron, in uh, nature say, maybe mirror neurons is just an association between. So I was very happy when we demonstrated that also emotions, which certainly are not there, that nobody taught me how to vomit. That's something that kids know immediately and uh, discuss and they say, laughing, the kids laugh almost immediately and so on. So as far as emotion and visceral motor activity, I am sure that's in it. For the other stuff, it's difficult to say. Uh, we know that, for example, the kids, newborn kids, is able to react to the mother. If the mother shows the tongue, he can respond showing the tongue. It's a kind of communication. However, that the recent part of it, which is early, is well demonstrated. First, in Holland, it has been shown that kids, which are unable to walk, but are able to crawl, do not have responses of their cortex when they see it, they keep them home. And as soon as they learn it, they have a response. And then there's a beautiful experiment done in London about ballet dance, which I described several times there, no time to tell. But uh, if you have a people, one professional dancer, and you, they, you present movie with dancing, you have a strong division of the periods. Instead, who is not dancer, it's very difficult. Even the people who are able to dance capoeira, which is this Brazilian dance, classical ballet is not for them. But even more, the people criticize, they say, well, but that's just practice. You see some body dancing, and you, that's nothing to do with motor systems, it's just visual stuff. So these people, which are clever, show it to male, the partner, female, and another male. So the relation is much stronger when you see another male dancing because he's doing the same moves, the same uh, steps that you are doing. So it's not a matter of vision, it's a matter of recognizing the motor activity in the eyes. So that's exactly what you said, it's motor that is also learning. Good.
could it be something strictly related to emotions, also this motor part? Maybe, say, maybe the, the feeling of um, um, being uh, so moved in seeing this kind of movement is more related to emotions than the actual movement part. Well, according to area which are activated, I must say no, but don't do anything look at to see what is happening in the emotional center. Maybe there is also a part of it, as you said. I think that this is the last question, because otherwise we're going to go too late. Okay. Thank you very much. So I was wondering, what happens if you ask the patient to imagine someone grasping? So when you ask him, uh, this has been done by Marc Gerard before us, and he demonstrated if you imagine to do yourself, there are two types of imagination. One you can imagine that he is running there, the other imagine yourself doing, you have the activation of the motor cord, it's practically the same circuit which I showed you for uh, uh, mirror. It's except maybe it's less, it's more towards the motor execution. So we have very little motor activity. They have also those uh, motor energy, also activation of M1 more than we have. But it's very simple, practically the same thing. And that's it's very important because we collaborate with Mark. And he claimed, and I think he's right, one element in favor of our idea that's so important that the mirror system is you and not the other. Because it's the same circuit when you think of doing an action. It's not another, it's you doing the action. And the same circuit that creates what you do. So I remember myself. If I made some small political consideration, which I have not done before, one I claim that it's very important to have a system which allows you to feel the emotion of others. It's because you, if you don't feel that, but you only understand in a cognitive way, you and I are not the same person. So the, 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 the disaster of Nancy in the 20s, this was because Gables, which was a great genius of propaganda, started to say that the Jews, and other people, but especially Jews, were responsible of their defeat in the war. Because they are not real people, they are two-dimensional, so they are not. And so, but if you decide that she is not a real man, but is good kind of monkey or so, to kill it. And it's not so terrible. Because we, we cut trees, we eat animals. So, you know, to have the idea that you and I are a human being, it's fundamental for the human good relationship. And that's it's the danger now when you start to say, well, but these people is not like us. One must be very careful about that. You, you must have the mechanism, you say. And the fact that it's biological mechanism does not imply that it's fixed and cannot be modified. So there are sociological experiments show that biological mechanisms can be modulated in one direction or in the other. So the notion that we feel what the other are and not we understand cognitively is very important also politically. Maybe, maybe close with maybe with the final philosophical question is that I mean there is a tendency to associate to an emotion a part of the area of the brain you were talking about again, but I mean I would expect that empathy, for example, is connected to mirror neurons, but could be related to the fact that in some areas, me and you, we are we are with the same disgust. So if I see you that you are eating something very disgusting, I can prove the disgust myself. And I would imagine that other areas are recruited. And I would imagine that by man to man, I mean the recruitment of areas is balanced differently. So do you think that emotion, which is such a complex thing, one day will be coded by neuroscience, so we remain something so much complex that uh, will be something, you know, left like a, a property of a human being. No, I think you have to distinguish what Darwin called the basic emotion, like disgust, which is present in animals, you recognize that, with higher order, like regret, 
And like that is something which probably is difficult to study in animal if there is, or even embarrassment. Although in dog sometimes seems to be embarrassment uh, when it's so clear on. But uh, there are certainly certain motion which is very complicated because it's made by different part of action. So uh, we don't know, it's very difficult. Although there are studies of regret in humans, there are many other Okay. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Uh, in uh, the lens hall, we have something to eat together, together with the speaker. So thanks for coming.